Welcome to another episode of Snack Sized Business. I'm your host, LB Adams, and as always, it is my joy to help amplify the work and the voices of women who are business owners, women who are in business, maybe working for someone else, and women who are driving industry. So today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Alexis Scipio. So Alexis came on my radar last year. We worked together on a presentation that she had to give, um, which she slayed, by the way. And uh, so we've had conversations ever since. I think she's amazing. So she is the founder of The Thrive Point, which is a company that helps other companies diversify their supply chains because diversity equals profitability. So let me give you Alexis's lowdown on her five biographical facts. I think you'll find them really interesting. Okay, so first of all, she says she grew up in the real Death Valley. So I'm chagrined to say that I don't know exactly where that is and I will look it up, but real Death Valley, okay. So uh, number two, she dated her husband's brother. I can only imagine that this makes for really interesting family gatherings. Uh, She says she learned a second language because she's lazy. Definitely have to ask her a little bit more about that one. Uh, Number four is (laughs) she loves canned meat. So I don't know if that means canned tuna, canned chicken, or spam, or all of the above. Definitely something to dive into. And then finally, she says that she would travel to the ends of the earth, literally, to see Sade in concert. So there you have it. Five facts from Alexis Scipio, founder of The Thrive Point. And let's welcome her to the show. Hello and welcome to Snack Size Business, Alexis Scipio. I'm so happy to have you on the show. Thank you for joining me. LB, thank you for having me. This is so dope. I'm so excited. <laughs> I know. I, I, I'm doing like a little happy dance over here. Let's yeah, get it exactly. dance. Girl, let's get it out. <laughs> take a moment. Let's take a moment. Yeah, exactly. So I have already done your intro. So our audience has a little bit of an idea of who you are um, and how odd you are. Beautiful, wonderfully, strangely odd, odd, which I love. So we have to talk about a couple of things. First of all, we need to talk about canned meat. What the hell, man? What the hell? <laughs> the bougie people like you, LB, <laughs> have given this gelatinous, coagulated, mushed meat like a bad name. And to be completely honest, like the element of heat, what it does to canned meat, is amazing, right? When you take that spam or corned beef hash and you oh, add it okay. to heat. Okay. Yeah, look, now there's a spectrum there. We're not just talking about Vienna sausages. There's a whole like spectrum to this canned meat and thing. You just listed things I didn't even think of. So I was thinking like canned tuna or canned chicken. Um, and I did, oh. it, spam did occur to me, but Vienna sausages, corned beef hash, like what? <laughs> Ye of little faith. Yes, there's there's life. And when you add that element of heat, the change mm. and transformation, I mean, yeah. it's wonderful. Oh, well, all right. So there I'm, you go. She is for it. Evangelizing the canned meat. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Maybe you've made some conversions out there. I don't know. All <laughs> right. So my second question is, um, and I have to look this up. I admittedly don't know. Where is Death Valley? Death Valley? for actually many South Carolinians, um, especially Clemson uh, Clemson alumni. Uh, They call their football field. It's a sacred ground they call Death Valley. But the real Death Valley is in California. Um, And that's where I'm from. I I was raised in the Mojave Desert. Um, I was in the Air Force as an Air Force child. So there's a base out there in this real obscure area. If you have ever seen those like mobster movies where they drive you out to the desert to never be seen again. Yeah. Yeah. Tumbleweeds. Um, That's Death Valley. That's where I'm from. Oh, I had no idea. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've flown over it, I'm sure. I just never flew So that's interesting. I didn't know that. Thank you for educating me geographically. I appreciate that. (laughs) Anytime. (laughs) All right. So let me jump into our first question. 
What conversation do you wish that you'd had, but you did not? I hope that you'll allow me to take a slightly different spin on this. Um, I want you to take whatever damn spin you want. Okay, well, we're going to twirl, honey. (laughs) I'd say over the past three years, I have been doing like a lot of self-talk. And that kind of looks like me loving on myself a little bit more. Um, Sometimes it's, you know, firing myself. Like I quite often will say when I have like limiting thoughts that I need to reframe or uh, constraints that I place on myself, I'll say, okay, you, Alexis Scipio, are fired. Let's bring in the boss, the dope girl that's going to get it done. Okay. So I bring her in and the other girl exits left. Um, I want to say for the past six months, six months, I've thought about, man, what would this have looked like if I could go back and talk to my 21 year old self, to my 30 year old self and say, listen, you spend a tremendous amount of energy focusing on your perceived weaknesses instead of focusing on the areas that you kill it in, you naturally glow in. Um, And I wished I had that opportunity to love on myself at 21 to say, girl, you are marvelous. You're miraculous. You're smart. And when you're in your zone of genius, you're unstoppable. Right. Gosh, that makes me feel so emotional. Um, And I'm sure that that will resonate with our audience as well. Like those conversations that we never had that we needed, that we know now that we needed. Good answer. Good answer. Okay. So here's question number two. Okay. What do you love about what you do? So and I know much. That we, all right. So I know that we, t- we throw the word <clears throat> love around too much. Like, oh, I love canned meat. Or, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, what lights you up about what you do? Okay, I got you. Like real love. Like I'm, I'm telling you, good, bad, and ugly. I am married to what I do. So um, first thing is I have a title for the past 15 years of working in procurement. And it's a real lofty title. When my kids ask me like, what's procurement? What do you do? I say, well, I just like shop all day. <laughs> and <laughs> where they think I'm probably like buying like Legos. I'm really buying buildings. I'm really buying large scale equipment. I'm really buying car parts. Um, there's this really fun period that's happening in the automotive industry where it's almost like the industrial revolution. It's the only thing I can compare it to. For 40 years, we've been buying combustion engines, right? Like it's been happening forever. They've been sourced the same way, but now on the cusp of this EV turn, it's phenomenal. It's so fun. And I think that's what's so important about this time is it's ripe, like the grounds are fertile and ripe for disruption. So I know you do a lot of like disrupt HR. Like I think of this as disrupt procurement because there's no better. Is it like the wild west out there? It's like, like, yes. It's like stick your flag in the ground, your white flag, this land is mine. Um, And it's beautiful. There's no better time to engineer uh, equitable sourcing into our processes. The the combustion engine had 456 pieces. Now they're down to like close to 300 parts for sourcing of this new technology. So this is the time to include women-owned tech companies. This is the time to make sure that you're engaging minority businesses. And this is the time to make sure um, you're sourcing sustainably, like doing audits to make sure that those suppliers and that supply chain are taking care of um, our resources. So it's a real wild, wild west time. I like you said that. Yeah. Oh, you're singing to my heart there. That sounds amazing. Um, The opportunity, the unknown, you know, and oh my gosh, it's just so alive, right? Yes. It's dynamic. It changes every day. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And I love that for you. That's amazing. All right. So let me go back. Let me go back for a second. Um, We need to talk about you dating your husband's brother. So salacious, huh? (laughs) So first of all, I want to know, like, how is Christmas? (laughs) Like, when the whole family's there and you're like, hey. Hey. It's not awkward at all. Um, Honestly, in 2004, if if we clear the cobwebs, like, you couldn't swipe right and swipe left, right? You 
you had to go on a blind date to right. learn about someone, right? right. So mm -hmm. um, I, I was at USC, uh, University of South Carolina, uh, and I uh, went on a blind date. And really early on, like the, the energy wasn't there. It was like pretty clear that it was gonna be platonic, you know, platonic vibes. So um, we ended that date and kind of like, just like stayed friends. And then two years later, um, I met this guy, just happenstance that like we really kicked it off. And on my second date with new guy, guy number two, he says, I want you to meet my brother. So after we end our date, I go, we go to meet his brother and like we both stop. And then new guy, guy number two said, do you guys know each other? And his was like, yeah, we went on dates. <laughs> But we are all good friends. It's all fun. Um, it's it's. I, I love being able to tell people I've dated both of these brothers. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is so good. That is so good. I love that. So here we go. Question number three. <clears throat> what communication advice do you live by? Okay. Um, I would like to say that the ones. Thing that comes to my mind um, is that I had a, a a manager, senior level manager, and it's, it's International Women's Day, so it's just like perfect. Um, she's she's a woman, um, and she called a meeting, um, like with like 30 minutes notice, like not much lead time. Everyone must attend. Okay, so she's not my manager; she's my manager's manager. And oh. in, in in our industry, when you get these emails with not a lot of notice, it typically means like every five to six years, there's a downturn and in manufacturing. That usually means they're doing workforce reductions or some sort of other, you know, it's usually not a good thing. So we, we, we really are like thinking it's like doom and gloom. Um, she opens up the meeting and says, hey, I wanted to let now 72. She had 72 reports on this call, on this Zoom call. And she said, hey, I'm calling this meeting to let you guys know that I made a really dumb mistake today. Okay. Now, half of the people on the call are German because I've largely worked for German companies. And I've got to say that for the Germanic culture, this type of move tends to be not a normal thing. She held and published, uh, held a call just to publish the fact that she made a mistake. Right. And I think that that moment was so transform transformative for me because then I realized that when you're able to connect with people, and uh, on a shared human experience, uh, like fear, like shame, no matter how polarizing the topic is, when you invite people in to walk with you and you have this shared experience, you have fostered trust. And that communication hits at a different level than it would if you hadn't taken a moment, if you hadn't been intentional and deliberate about doing something to create this uh, rapport and feeling of trust. Wow. How brave of her to be that vulnerable. That wow. was a maverick in this industry. We're not talking about these soft tech industries where they're all yeah. about hugs and kumbaya. This was absolutely <laughs> right. out of the norm. Yeah, I can imagine. And mm -hmm. it was a woman as well, correct? Yep. Yeah. So she was mm -hmm. for a woman in that position to call together all of those people and say, I effed up is really brazen and bold and badass and i right. can't think of any more bees but there you go all the bees all the bees and i mean and how how wonderful is that now that when i make a mistake i feel this freedom to come to her and say hey this is what i did here's what i'm yeah. doing a course correct you know yes. like yes. the communication we had after that moment was so much truer was so much it was effortless and it left um it, it just, it put us in a great position. And, you know, truthfully, I wish that corporations um, could take note of that, could take note of this human experience in their external and internal communications. And, 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 and who are we kidding? I understand that they go through these letters, go through general counsels and compliance and HR leaders. And by the time that communication to the employee base is finished, it's kind of, you know, engineered all the soul out of it. Um, right. But I do think we're missing an authentic voice. Um, and I think companies have to work out like, what, what can we do to relate and communicate to our employee base that feels real, that feels true, and lets them know that we can understand their plight. Yeah, that's an excellent point. So how would you sum up that experience in one sort of advisory sentence? Distill. 
Mm, Disto. I remember that, LB. I would say invite, share your human experience. Invite people um, on that shared path with you. Like, you know, hey, I know what fear looks like. I know what it promise looks like. Um, yes. You know, just lead with something that lets them know, like, yeah, you know, we, we are human. We, we share this, no matter how polarizing the topic, we share, um, you know, the elements of the human experience. So you had referenced today is International Women's Day, you know, within uh, Women's History Month. Um, mm-hmm. And the theme uh, for International Women's Day for the month is storytelling. And so this month is really um, the idea is to honor all of the storytellers and in whatever ways people tell stories. And I love that because it's the stories that connect us. As you yes. just said, yes. you remember this and the fact that 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 particular person told the story to all of these people about how she screwed up and mm-hmm. how she's going to make it right. But that that was binding and it was um, really eye opening. Yes, I love that. That's terrific. All right, my friends. So I have one final ish question. So you learned a second language because you're lazy. Can you explain that? Because that seems to oxymoronic. Yes, I can. Um, <laughs> sorry. I um, I am. I'm like innately lazy. And I had a neighbor when I was a kid that was a German teacher. And I thought for sure, for sure, if I take her class, I know her outside of school, like she's going to go easy on me. But she didn't. She, she, she did not. And, <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm glad that she didn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's um, very funny. Yeah. So you think that's because you thought she'd be easy and she probably ended up being more difficult on you or harder on you because she knew you outside of class. Right. She was, oh, goodness gracious. She was quite something. Frau Martinson. Um, and uh, yeah, and I'm glad she didn't because it actually opened up a lot of um, opportunities for me. Um, I mostly work with German companies. So um, right. yeah. So are you uh, prolific? I mean, are you, what is your level? Can you? Prolific, wow, I wish. Um, There's a huge technical component um, to fluency. So I definitely have had years where I haven't had to use the language as much and that's shown, but I'm conversationally fluent. Um, I know some technical terms um, that typically are car parts like the crankshaft is called the (laughs) Kubavela. Um, but yeah, it's um, it, it's fun. I can use more 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 practice. But German is um, like a lot of languages where there's a lot of dialects. So often you um, oh, right, right. speak the language, and I speak like High German, which is what you're what you're taught in schools. Interesting. All right. Well, my friend, those are all of the questions. I feel like we could sit here and chitter chatter all day. Yeah. But those are. <laughs> Typically, all of the questions that I have for you. Thank you so much for your time and your really great humor and your expertise. I love it. I love it all. Oh, thank you, Elby. Thank you for having me. A little shimmy shake on the way out. There we go. Let's <laughs> dance it out. Dance it out. Okay. Love you. Bye, Elby. <laughs>